Good afternoon. This is Sharon Cleck from Mind and Messiah Ministries, and we are doing our midweek teaching. We have been talking about a couple of weeks ago, we talked about angelic assistance in warfare. So today we're going to begin to go over that again. Behind me on the board, and if you want a screenshot, that, that would be a good thing because I'm not going to go through all this. I just went through all this with our group that was local here because I'm not really teaching on Daniel's 70 weeks. I'm teaching on angelic assistance and warfare. And so we're going to take a good look at how Daniel was uh, working and moving in a warfare mode when the angelic assistance came. Two weeks ago, we looked at Jacob going back to meet Esau, and he was warring with the angel, which is Yahweh himself, and he warred all night long. He wrestled until he prevailed, and once he prevailed, then Yahweh sent from the book of Jasher is what I read out of, Yahweh sent three angels that appeared as 2,000 men of war in four different companies of 500 each that went out to meet Esau. Jacob didn't have information on this. He warred with God in prayer the night before, pressing in. It says in the word that the, the uh, fervent and the righteous, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now we are righteous by the blood of Yeshua, but do we pray fervently? Do we know how to really do warfare? And that's why we're looking at this because as we learn to press into the things of God, we have angelic beings show up. We don't even have to ask for them to be here. When we start to pray, they respond to our prayers. We have seen it here in our own group where we're praying and angels show up, not because we asked for them, they manifested themselves. It was what God chose for them to do, not what we imagined are forced or tried to get mustered up. These are things by God's sovereignty that begin to happen. And the angels are working. God's uh, angelic beings are part of our family. We are all one family. We are all created beings. We are created to be seen in the visible. They are created to be seen in the invisible. They do have the ability to move from visible to invisible at times. And we have plenty of things in the scriptures that show us that. We have Yahweh showing up to Abraham right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He even sits down and has a meal. He eats. So this is a flesh body that can actually consume food and drink and talk to him. And yet it is the supernatural being. So we talked about this earlier in one of our other studies is that I think this past week in the Torah study is that uh, the ancient Near East had an understanding that there were two Yahwehs. There was the Yahweh that was invisible that they didn't see. And there was the Yahweh that showed up in the flesh because it happens often in the scriptures. And they understood that. He is the same Yahweh, but to them, that's how they understood that. So as we move forward today, we're actually looking at angelic assistance, angelic intervention in our warfare, when we go to prayer, when God shows up, when we go to prayer. Behind me is written down Daniel 70 weeks of years. And I wrote that down and I broke it apart for the group here because I knew they were going to have questions. This is not the focus of my teaching today. That's why I'm not going to go over it. I'll briefly just tell you very quickly that Israel went into captivity for 70 years because they did not let the land rest for 490 years. Then they had, from the time that they were decreed to go back and rebuild the temple was 49 years. So that's seven sevens. So that was seven weeks. Then from the time that the temple was rebuilt to the time that Yeshua was cut off was another 62 weeks. And so that's 434 weeks. And this is all based on a Hebrew calendar of 360 days instead of a Gregorian calendar of 365. So what we have left of these 70 weeks is seven years. And that's where we get that seven-year tribulation that we're talking about in the book of Revelations. 
That last week is broke up even further, three and a half years and three and a half years. So what we believe, we could have this wrong, but this is generally what the scholars will teach, what biblical teachers will teach about the 70 weeks of Daniel. Maybe we have it right, maybe we don't, because guess what? We don't know it all, unfortunately. But this is our understanding that there is one week left and I actually believe that we have begun to enter into that last week. I really personally do not believe that we will see the last three and a half years because it's not accounted to God's people for wrath. So regardless of how we view that or what all this is about, our focus today is angelic intervention during warfare. So that's where we're gonna to start today. We've already had prayer. We've been praying for some of the people here that had some issues. And so we've already asked God for his anointing, for his presence of Father, yes. If you would like to send us some angelic presence while we're teaching on that, we are more than happy to have you to accommodate us. Thank you, Father. So a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you about the power of angelic assistance and warfare. And I want to pick it back up there again this week. We had another teaching last week. We looked at a, a current prophetic word and we broke that down compared to a dream. I may get that posted. I don't know if I'm going to have time. So we're picking up now where we were two weeks ago. We considered that if only one third of the angels fell in rebellion to Yahweh, that that meant that there were still two thirds left that were loyal to Yahweh's throne. So if we consider that since angelic beings are created beings, that Yahweh may have created even more. There's nothing that would stop him from creating more angelic beings after the fall of what we consider one third. We talked about the fact that the only scripture that we have to tell us that one third of the angels fell is out of the book of Revelations where it talks about the dragon who with his tail drew a third of the stars and stars are often um, used to signify angelic beings. So you and I, we've talked about this many times. When you come to Yeshua, and you receive forgiveness for your sins through the blood of Yeshua, nobody told you when you said, yes, I've decided to follow Jesus. Nobody said, well, then put on your armor because you're in a war. But the truth is that is what it's all about. When you give your heart to Yeshua, when you say, I have decided to follow Yeshua, that means all or nothing. It means that you are totally sold out to him, that you have become a slave. He is your master. We are here to do his bidding. We are in his army. When I was a little girl, one of the very first songs I learned in a Sunday school was that I was uh, in the Lord's army. It was onward Christian soldiers, onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. You know, I never knew that that meant that I was in a war. I just thought that was a cute little song. And we liked marching and we had our crosses. And we, we didn't have the concept that we actually were in a war. But this is the good news. You are made to war. If you belong to Yeshua, you were made to war. If you're in the human flesh, you were made to have dominion. You have been given dominion. We are supposed to be ruling on this earth and bringing in the kingdom of God to this earth. And somehow we just miss that. We just, we go, we got our Willy Wonka ticket, golden ticket, we're going to heaven, we're, we're cool. And nobody told us that we were in a battle and we have an obligation to battle. We are enlisted if we like it or not. So for the past few years, we've been talking about this. When we started teaching on this and learning, it was four years ago. And a lot of people did not know that they could do warfare, that they had weapons, that they had armor that they were called to battle. Many people didn't understand that. And now that concept has become much more clear. Well, in the past four years, it's become abundantly clear. 
We are in a life and death battle right now. And we're in a life and death battle for our loved ones and even for ourselves. But the good news is that you are a soldier and you have been equipped to battle and you can stand your ground and you can fight and you can even take ground for the kingdom of God. Each of us, each and every one of us should be causing some distress of some kind in the spiritual realm. If you are not stirring up the kingdom of darkness with your prayer life, then you're not doing your job. Satan's time is sharp and he knows it. And part of the reason it's sharp is because people who pray are hindering his agenda. And you're making him stop and clean up little messes here and there. It doesn't matter if you're just throwing a stumbling block in his way through praying in the spirit about something. Any hindrance that you can cause to the kingdom of darkness is a good one. So we continually go back to the beginning of our faith to remember the joy of our salvation because there's a lot of things going on right now that hinder our joy, that rob us. We talked beforehand, before I started here today, we have, I have a pastor friend. He's actually a disciple of my husband and my late husband and I, we love him dearly. He's been giving a diagnosis that is a really bad diagnosis. And the sadness has been very heavy. And I keep saying to people, when that sadness gets heavy, you have to be in the word. The word will replace the sadness. The enemy wants to keep you in that position so that you are not effective in your prayer, so that you're not effective in the kingdom of God. If he can keep you sad, if he can keep you grieving, if he can keep you mourning, then you're distracted and he doesn't have to be bothered by you. Stay in the word. And particularly the Psalms. The Psalms will lift you up in nothing flat. You talk about fighting the enemy and walking in victory. King David knew all about that. And he, his words will lift you up. Just look at Psalms 91. We are hidden under the shadow of the Almighty. You talk about angelic assistance. You stumble your foot. The angels are there to lift you up. You know, when I first started reading Psalms 91, I thought that was a, a word, a prophetic word for Yeshua only, but it's not. And the reason I know that is because it says, and with long life will I satisfy you. Yeshua was not satisfied with a long life on this earth. But when you are obedient, when you are an obedient child, to the kingdom of heaven and to the word of God. He will satisfy you with a long life. I'm not saying that 100%, but I can tell you, I'm holding on to that word. I'm holding on to that. I want to be alive and see the coming of the Lord. So I'm holding on. So if we go back to the beginning of our faith, we will remember the joy of our salvation. That's super important right now. Never forget the joy of your salvation. The moment that you gave your heart to the Lord, what happened? Oh my God, all the burdens lifted. It all lifted off of you. It was like you gave it to him. It's gonna be okay. All of the sin that you had in your life at that moment didn't, it's like the consequences of that sin didn't all go away. The earthly consequences but the eternal consequences of that sin were lifted. And all of a sudden you're free because who the father sets free is free indeed. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He wants us to walk in liberty. So if we remember the joy of our salvation, we had nothing to offer God, but our sinful self. We hadn't spent time in the word. We hadn't done work for the Lord. We had, we didn't have nothing to offer him. Here I am, God. And he said, come on, child, I love you. I'll take you just like you are. And the longer we serve God, the more we think we have to offer him. We are nothing. We are nothing without him. 
He is everything. He is our all in all and he is our everything. And he's the only one that, that gives us the power and the strength to move forward in the things that he's asking us to do. So remembering the joy of your salvation will stir you up to go, okay, God, I made promises to you on that day. I made vows to you on that day. I don't want to leave this earth and not keep those vows. Let's make a pact with ourselves to do all the things that we said we were going to do on the day that we turned our life over to the Lord. And since then, so we are in this life and death battle and each one of us would do well to rehearse the day that we surrender, the day that you committed to follow Yeshua with your whole heart. But if you can't remember that day or you can't recall exactly where that was and what time it wasn't, I don't remember the exact day. I know the month, I know the year. I, you know, I, I didn't keep track of the exact day, but I could probably go back and figure because it's like 50 years now. <laughs> it's a long time. But if you don't know, if you can't go back and remember the day that you surrendered, then you need to do it now. You need to go back and go, I don't remember. Did I really surrender? Did I really fully commit to God? Or was this a mental ascent? Did I just go, well, that, that gospel sounds pretty good. He's going to take away my sins. He mm -hmm. suffered for me. And, and did you just reason that? Or did you fully commit to him? Because if you haven't, you need to do that now and make that commitment fresh. Go before him and say, God, it's all or nothing. I'm totally surrendered. It's all or nothing. So have to ask ourselves, how committed am I? Have I begun to die to myself? Or are you still on the throne of your own life? So are you taking your decisions to him? Are you taking what you do with your finances to him? Are you taking your relationships to him? Are you asking his wisdom about everything in your life? Are, are you still on the throne of your own life? Are you still calling the shots on doing what you want to do? Choosing your own days, choosing your own will, choosing your companions, choosing your, the way you spend your money. How much of that is submitted to God on a daily basis? So Yeshua is either master of all or he's not master at all. I must say that again. Either Yeshua is master of all or he's not master at all. You decide. Is he consulted about your daily decisions? Do you talk to him on and off all day long throughout the day? How much time did you spend in the word asking him to teach you? When you're in that word, are you saying, God, teach me? I don't understand this. This is not clear to me. How did this happen? Why did this happen? What do you want me to learn out of this? Ask him questions. Ask him to grant you wisdom and understanding. Do we ask for those aha moments where all the puzzles just kind of fit together? That all of a sudden you have understanding that you never had before. To me, there's nothing greater. There's no more excitement in my life than learning something new about God or about the word to where, oh my God, it fits together. I finally get it. I finally get it. I've been trying to figure this out all my life. I was reading that book on um, uh, the, uh, the realm and, and it by Heiser and um, the unseen realm. And I, I, he read a, there was a par paragraph right in the middle of the book. And I read that and it went, oh, there's the answer. And he's talking about the seed of Satan, the seed, seed of God. Questions that I had had. And there in the forward of that first of that chapter was the answer. It was just went, oh my God. So now I have to go back and I have to meditate over that. I have to ponder. I have to brood over that word and go, okay, how is that right? Because when I read it, I went, oh my God, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. Now I need to brood over that because I can't always speak what God shows me until I started getting it into myself. That's part of loving him, part of bringing him and his word into you on a daily basis. So I find that when I learn a new truth, that I ponder it over and over again until I begin to say, well, then if this is true, then that means that's true over there in that scripture. Or this other book. Oh my God, now I see how it all fits together. 
is such a joy. So in this spiritual war we find ourselves in, we have to keep our minds right. This is about having our minds right. If, uh, Philippians 2.5, it says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So the idea of let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, is to have the same kind of mindset that he had, or the same kind of thinking that Yeshua had. Specifically, Paul's talking about how Yeshua, as God, was willing to give up his glory and to humble himself and to become a man, to come in the flesh, God in the flesh, and then to die, to let somebody kill him, a brutal death on the cross. Yeshua gave himself up as an expression of love and was willing to lower himself to express that love. He is the supreme example of love, of humility. As Yeshua himself put it, no one has greater love than to give his life for another. That's John 15, 13. So Paul has challenged us to think like Yeshua thought. <clears throat> Think like Yeshua. I just told you he laid his life down for others. We're supposed to think like Yeshua, to be willing to lower ourselves for the benefit of others. And that's how we can be of the same mind, maintaining the same love and intent on one purpose. By being willing to make our own interests and our purposes subservient for the good of other people. So how often are we doing what makes us happy and not even concerning ourselves about what makes other people happy and having their needs met? If we keep our mind right, if our mind is right, our body will follow. You know, I know this from <clears throat> personal experience. Every time I wanna lose weight or do something healthy or whatever, if I go and read about that, and get my mind renewed. Like if I wanna do intermittent fasting, if I go read a couple articles on intermittent fasting, my body just follows. I, I get my mind right, my body just follows because my mind is right. So if our mind is right, if we have the mind of Messiah, we will begin to follow in the natural, in the earthly realm. So that's why it's so important for us to renew our mind. If the mind is right, renewed by God's word, the body will not act on its own to sin. You, you got to tell your body what to do. It doesn't get up and do stuff without you telling it what to do. It will be led by the mind. It's our decision-making abilities that determines what the body does or doesn't do. So we spoke about this before. Our body doesn't just take itself to the tattoo parlor. So when I visited my daughter yesterday, there was somebody there and he said, do you want to see my new tattoo? Well, he already had a bunch already on him. I went, another one? Why? He said, well, because I got space. He made up his mind to fill that space and he went and had it done. His body didn't go on its own accord. He had to make an appointment. He had to call. He had to plan to do that. It's keeping your mind right before God and your body will follow. Our body doesn't take itself to the tattoo parlor without our mind telling it to go there. But the mind dictates much of what the body does. If we put things in it that the body becomes addicted, then the body starts mastering the mind. You start being led by the, by the body, you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're just sticking things in your mouth or shooting things up or whatever because your body says, feed me, feed me, feed me. And your mind's not even thinking about, oh my God, this is going to ruin my marriage. This is going to ruin my kids. It's going to ruin my life. I'm going to lose my job. No, because your body is leading. So if our mind is renewed with the word of God, then our body will follow the mind of Christ that he's put in us. So warfare is loving other people. We don't take the time to pray or intercede for others if we don't love them. Often we pray for those that we don't even know, but that's because we love mankind. We love humankind. 
So we choose to pray for those people. All these things happening out in California right now with all the flooding and people losing their homes and, and, and being evacuated. I'm praying for those people. I don't know those people, but I hope that if something happens to me that they're praying for me. So we're living in a time of great disruption. Great. We have solar flares coming out. All of the flights were canceled today across the country. Their, their communications are down. So they can't figure out how to get beyond that. We're not in control of everything. Mankind thinks they are, but they're not. So we're in a time of great disruptions. We're seeing earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and the way that we view marriage and gender and everything that we have held dear all of our lives is being shaken, everything. And we need to have our eyes open to the battle. There's a battle. We need to have our eyes open to that. And that doesn't mean watching the evening news and I pray that what I need to know gets sent to me in some form or the other because I'm not turning that thing on. God, I ask God, to meet my needs so that I know what I need to know. So the words that come across that TV are lies. Most all of them are lies. They may have a little bit of truth in them, but they're more lies than they are truth. And I've told you this before, the media is the long arm, the propaganda arm of the Antichrist. If you're gonna sit in front of it, expect to be programmed. That's why they call it programming because that's what they're doing with you. They're programming you. If you want your mind to be mindless, then sit in front of it, they'll mesmerize you, hypnotize you, and lead you astray. And your body will follow what you just saw on TV and do what you just heard, because they'll scare you to death. They'll send terror into your heart. And that's their job, because they're working for the enemy. It's a war. So their words will convince you that something is true when it may even be the complete opposite. And our prayer is to have wisdom, understanding, and discernment, super need discernment. So this is what warfare is not. Warfare is not praying to get yourself out of a crisis that you created on your own. <laughs> People are talking about that all the time. Man, I'm really being attacked. I'm really in a battle. It's something they did themselves to bring it on themselves, yeah. but have not been willing to accept it because they're not on, they have not died to themselves. It's always somebody else's fault. Whatever's going on, somebody else brought that on me. I didn't do that <clears throat> because they don't know how to confess their sins and make it right with God. The quicker that we do that, the quicker that we go, the, the quicker that we go, I'm guilty. I screwed up. God, forgive me. The quicker things will be made right. God will fix things for you when you repent. He did it for David. David was a murderer and an adulterer, but he had a repentant heart. He loved God. He trusted God. He loved the word of God. To him, it was precious. So, Warfare is not just getting yourself out of something that you did yourself. Warfare is loving and praying for others and trusting God to meet your needs as you intercede for others. So it's a moment of faith. You take the time to pray for others, God meets your needs. It's a faith move. In this new year, we need to close loops in our life. Things that are in our life that have never been resolved. It's a time to shut them down. The things that keep coming up in your life over and over again. How many times have you fought the same battle over and over? Reminds me of Vietnam. They'd fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and take a hill and they'd take the hill and two days later they'd abandon it and the enemy would come back and get it. Yeah. That's what happens in our lives. We keep fighting the same battles over and over because we never dealt with what started the thing or the core issue involved in it. So they just keep coming up. So we keep thinking that we'll get to it later, but we never do. And until it explodes in your face. So this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to jot this down so that you will give some thought 
to some of those areas. If there are things, take some time to sit down with a journal, a piece of paper and say, God, what is it in my life that just keeps coming up over and over and over? And why? What's the reason behind that? Is this demonic? Is this an attack? Is this something in my past that I haven't owned up to or I haven't dealt with on my own? God, please show me. Help me to understand. Teach me. He loves to teach you. He loves to teach you. So ask God if you have unresolved issues that need dealt with and ask him to show you what they are and how to face them. So last time we talked about this, we spoke about angelic assistance and warfare. And we discovered that angels are spirit persons who serve. They serve us. So in Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And then another translation says it this way. Aren't they all merely spirits who serve, sent out to help those who God will deliver? Well, that sounds like you and me. That's us, the sons of God, through the promise of Abraham. And then in Revelation 22, 8, it says, and I, John, saw these things, and I heard them. And then I had heard and seen, when I had heard and seen, I fell down and I worshiped before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. These are things we talked about last time. The angels are not there for you to command. They are fellow servants. These people sitting here at the table taking notes today, I don't command them to do anything and they don't command me to do anything. We are fellow servants in the kingdom of God. That's what the angelic beings are. They are fellow servants working with us to bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. They are fellow servants and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And he says, worship God, worship Yahweh. That's who you worship, not me. So we understand that the angelic family, faithful to Yahweh's throne, are fellow servants. So someone asked me if we can command angels last week. I got that question. And I responded that I don't see that in the scriptures. They said, well, if they're here to minister to us, doesn't that mean that we can command them? And this was my answer. A fellow servant is one who serves alongside of you. You and I are sisters in the Lord and we serve alongside each other. I do not command you and you do not command me. We are fellow servants and we assist one another in bringing about the kingdom of Yahweh on this earth. That's what we do. So we have an innumerable amount of angels ready to assist us and we are not asking or requesting their help. I finished up last time with the story from the book of Jasher. It was a story of Jacob and Esau and how God had sent out the three angels and they became 2,000 men. That was an astounding story. If you haven't heard that, go back and look at that um, message called Angelic Assistance and Warfare because that was really good. So the way that, that we saw this unfold was nothing short of an amazing thing in that book of Jasher, just amazing. And the angels came in response to Jacob's wrestling. That's why they came. His warfare. We war. We wrestle in the spirit. When we see the same thing happening in the book of Daniel. So the angel comes to respond to Daniel's prayer. Daniel is in warfare, just like Jacob was in warfare. This is not just a simple prayer, but it is a repeated prayer of pressing into God to gain greater understanding. That's what Daniel's after. He's wanting greater understanding of what he had read in the scroll of Jeremiah about the return of Israel to the land. So Daniel's prayer for his people of Daniel 9, 1. And we're going to read a good portion of that scripture. In the middle of it, we're going to look at Jeremiah and why, what Daniel was looking at in the scroll of Jeremiah. So we're in Daniel 9, 1. Okay, Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, 
who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books the number of years which, according to the word of the Lord, or Jehovah, to Jeremiah, the prophet, must pass before the desolations which had been pronounced on Jerusalem would end. And it was 70 years. So he sees that he's getting his information from the scripture. That's where we look. We look at the scripture. It tells us what's going to come. We need wisdom, just like he did, to understand. We don't always understand what we've read in the scripture, but we need that to be able to understand. So this is what Jeremiah said. Uh, this is Jeremiah 25, verse 11. This whole land will be waste and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. He comes right out and says how long they're going to serve Babylon. Then when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. The land of the Chaldeans or Babylonia, says Yahweh, for their wickedness. And I will make the land of the Chaldeans a perpetual waste. For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit, inspect you, and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. So this is written down by the prophet Jeremiah. And Daniel is reading faithfully, staying in the word, staying in the word of the prophets, staying in the Torah and trying his best to understand, when are we ever gonna be out of this captivity? Jeremiah had told the captives, this is God's punishment. Go into captivity, get married, have children, bail homes, have businesses, settle down in that land, because you're not coming back next week. You're not coming back anytime soon. You're gonna be there 70 years. So let's continue on Daniel 9. Verse three, so I directed my attention to Yahweh to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He is trying to die to himself, that his ears will be open, that his eyes will be open, that his understanding will be able to receive what Yahweh is saying to him. I prayed to the Lord, my God, and I confessed and I said, oh Lord God, the great and the awesome God who keeps his covenant. He always keeps his covenant. He extends loving kindness to those who love him and get, keeps his commandments. You want loving kindness from God, keep his commandments. Verse five, we have sinned. We've committed wrong. He's including himself and have behaved wickedly. And we've rebelled, turning away from your commandments and ordinances. This is how we should be praying. That's what America has done. That's exactly what America has done. He's confessing the sins of the people, telling God that he is a righteous God and that they deserve the punishment. When we see this coming, we're going, oh God, why is this happening? Why is that happening? We deserve the punishment. We've done the same things. We've turned our back on God. We took him out of schools. We took them out of the universities and we've even taken them out of the churches. Further, verse three, we have not listened to and heeded your servants and prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, to our princes and to our fathers and to all the people of the land. Do you know that there are more prophecies about the end times in the Old Testament than there are in the book of Revelations or the New Testament? And we have rejected the old in this nation. And the prophecies as to what is coming are going to be found there. Just like the book of Daniel that I'm reading right now. Daniel 9, 7. Righteousness belongs to you, O Yahweh, but it is to us confusion and open shame. And it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all of Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, to all the countries to which you have driven them. They're driven all over the place. 
and you did that because of their sin and they deserved it because you are a righteous God. You told us this would happen. You told us it would happen and we would not listen in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the treacherous acts of unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Verse eight, oh Yahweh, to us belongs confusion and open shame to our kings, to our princes and to our fathers because they have sinned against you. To Yahweh, our Elohim, belongs mercy. You are merciful, loving kindness and forgiveness. For we have rebelled against him. The only way we're going to get mercy and forgiveness and loving kindness is by becoming obedient and confessing our sins and being a repentant nation. This nation needs to repent. We need to start with ourselves and repent. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Yes, all of Israel has transgressed, all of us. We've all transgressed your laws, even turning aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us. The oath, which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because he has, we have sinned against him. So what's he talking about? He's talking about Deuteronomy 28. If you do this, 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 and this, you are blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the field, you'll be blessed coming in, you'll be blessed coming up, be blessed in the storehouse. Your kind will always deliver properly. There'll be food, there'll be sunshine, there'll be water, there'll be rain in due season. All of these blessings, there won't be any sickness. All these blessings will come upon you. If you are obedient, you'll be able to stay in the land. But if you are disobedient, you're gonna get every curse that was on Egypt, every curse that's named in this book and this Torah, portion of 28, Deuteronomy 28, plus more that you have never even heard of before. We are going to see things we've never heard of before because we're disobedient and stiff-necked and we want to do it ourselves and we want to be on our own throne and we don't want to bow down and worship God. We want to be our own God in this nation. And he has carried out completely his threatening words. Yahweh made threatening words. He told you what would happen. This wasn't done unexpectedly. I told you, God says, what would happen. And now it has. Threatening words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers, the kings, the princes, the judges who ruled us. That's who he's talking to right now. We have kings, princes, and rulers that are leading this nation astray, who ruled us to bring us on, to bring on us a great tragedy for under the whole earth, there has not been done anything so dreadful like that which he commanded and has done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses and all of this tragedy has come upon us, yet we have not wholeheartedly begged for forgiveness. That's where we're supposed to be wholeheartedly begging for our forgiveness. Not a little patty cake. Gee, God, I'm really sorry. We just see all this stuff going on. We're really sorry that they won't listen to you. And this is a wholehearted begging for forgiveness. And sought the favor of God by turning from our wickedness and paying attention to and placing value in your truth. There's no value placed in the truth of God. We do not place value in his truth. We pick and we choose what we want from God. What commandments that we want to obey and what ones we declare are no longer applicable. We don't have to do that. That's Old Testament. God doesn't expect that. Verse 14. Therefore, the Lord has kept the tragedy ready and he's brought it upon us. For Yahweh our Elohim is uncompromisingly righteous and openly just in all of his works, which he does. He keeps his word. He keeps his word. He says, I'm going to punish you, you when you do these things. You better listen. He keeps his word. And we have not obeyed his voice. 
And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name as it is today. We have sinned. We have been wicked. He is reminding God of their great acts of deliverance in the past. What Daniel is realizing is that there was a set time for this punishment. And it was declared by the prophets and that Yahweh is now cutting. He's not going to cut this time short. It's going to be the whole 70 years. But now we're getting to the end of that. So now I'm coming back and I want to know, are we almost there? Verse 19, O oh Lord, in accordance with all of your righteousness and just acts, please let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. That's where he said he wanted to put his name. Your holy mountain, because of our sins and the wickedness of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of scorn and contemptuous byword of all who are around us. This is God's city. This is a place in all the earth that he has chosen to place his name. And yet he let it become desolate because of their sin. Verse 19, I'm sorry, 17. Now, therefore, our God, listen, heed the prayers of your servant Daniel and his supplication. And for your own sake, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. This is not just for me, God. It's for your name's sake. Please let your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary. Please let us reestablish it. Oh, my God, incline your ears and hear. Open your eyes and look at our des uh, desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you because of our own merits and righteousness. We have no merit. We have no righteousness. But because of your great mercy and your compassion, that's the only way this is going to get answered. We don't deserve your deliverance. Verse 19, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. Do not delay for your own sake. Oh my God, please, because your city and your people are called by your name. Please, God. So then Gabriel brings an answer. Verse 20, while I was still speaking and praying, and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God, in behalf of the whole mountain of my God. While I was just speaking in prayer, and extremely exhausted, he's prayed till he's exhausted. So was Jacob. Jacob wrestled all night till he couldn't go anymore. The man Gabriel, whom I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me about the time of the evening sacrifice. And Daniel was praying until he was exhausted. This is a battle. This is war. Verse 22. He instructed me and he talked with me. And he said, oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and wisdom and understanding. That's what he's praying for. Wisdom, insight, understanding. That's what we should pray for. At the beginning of your supplication, the command to give you an answer was issued. When he began to pray. The commandment was given for an answer to come. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly regarded and greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the message and begin to understand the meaning of the vision. There was a commandment issued from above. So Yahweh sends an angel to answer this prayer. Verse 24, 70 weeks of years are 49 years have been decreed for your people and for your holy city, Jerusalem. That's what this is about back here. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make an end of sin. That's what needs to happen. An end of sin. To make atonement, reconciliation for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Right standing with God. That's what we're looking for. Everlasting righteousness. The right standing with God. To seal up the vision, the prophecy, and the prophet. 
and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 29, 25. So you are to know and understand that from the issuance of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah, the anointed one, the prince, there will be 70 weeks of years and 62 weeks of years. It will be built again with a city, plaza and moat, even in times of trouble. For all of you that read Ezra and Nehemiah, you know how much trouble they went through to get that temple rebuilt. And it took them 49 years, which was seven times seven. So that was the first set of sevens. Then it says, in verse 25, so you are to know and understand that from the issuance of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah, the anointed one, the prince, there will be 70 weeks of weeks and 62 weeks of weeks. It will be built again with a city, plaza and moat, even in times of trouble. The angel is telling Daniel, your people will return. The temple will be rebuilt. Here's the big one. The Messiah will come. So not only is the temple going to be rebuilt, not only is the city going to be rebuilt and the walls, but Messiah is going to come. The promised Messiah will come. Daniel is told that this is the Messiah. Yeshua is the Messiah. He came in the time frame that Daniel heard from the angel. The angel's telling Daniel, your people will return temple will be rebuilt, and the Messiah will come. Verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks of years, the anointed one will be cut off. He is sacrificed and denied his messianic kingdom and having nothing and no one to defend him. And the people of the other prince, we know who the other prince is, who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary its end will come with a flood, even to the end, there will be war, desolations, and they are determined. Verse 29, and he will enter into a binding and an irrevocable covenant with the many for one week, seven years, one week. But in the middle of that week, he will stop the sacrifice and the grain offering for the remaining three and a half years. And on the wing of an abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who causes the horror. So about now Daniel's going, what? What does all this mean? So the angel has more than answered Daniel's prayer. He's not only told him that the walls will be rebuilt, the temple will be rebuilt, but now Messiah is coming. They've waited. They have waited. And now he's telling him Messiah will come. And this is in the time frame that he will come. And he did come in that time frame. Comes on a wing of abomination. He makes desolate, even into the completion, the complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on one who causes the har. So there is one who causes har. So the angels more than answered Daniel's prayer. He's gone way beyond what Daniel was asking. So in prayer, in spiritual warfare, praying and seeking answers, who comes to answer them? Angelic intervention and warfare, angelic assistance and warfare. They come to tell us what is happening what's going to happen. And sometimes we don't even understand what we heard. That's why we journal. That's why we write it down. Daniel wrote it down so we would have it. The angels more than told them that. So let's continue on in chapter 10. In chapter 10, you'll see one more thing. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the message was true. And it referred to a great conflict, warfare, misery, great conflict, warfare, misery is what that word means. And he understood the message and he had an understanding of the vision. So this vision he understands. In those days, I, Daniel, 
had begun mourning for three entire weeks. I ate no tasty food, nor did any meat or wine enter my mouth, and I did not anoint or refresh or groom myself at all for this full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was on the bank of the great river, uh, Heldel, Kel, which is a Tigris, I raised my eyes and I looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen. This is again, angelic beings who look like a man. Same thing we saw with Jacob. When he wrestled with the angel, there was a man. Same way with Joshua, right before they're ready to go into Jericho, who shows up? The, the head of the army of hosts. Who is the head of the army of hosts? But Yeshua, yeah. the Lord of hosts. He shows up as a man. This is how God is able to relate to humankind is by showing up in a common form so that he can relate to us. That's why Yeshua came in the flesh so we could relate to him because he was tested in all ways like we were. He was tried in every way that we were. There's nothing that we go through that he hasn't already experienced on this earth in his time. And so he said he ate no tasty food. He'd been mourning. And so it's the uh, verse four on the 24th day of the first month, as I was on the bank of the great river, that's the Tigris. He looked up, he sees this man in white linen, verse five, whose loins were girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz, which is a, fa a famous gold region that U-P-H-A-Z, that is a region that has lots of gold. And he's saying this gold is so pure, it looks like it came from Upfaz or Uphaz, U-P-H-A-S, Upfaz. Verse six, his body also was like beryl with gold luster, golden luster. And his face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches and his arms and his feet were like the gleaming of burnished bronze. And the sound, the sounds of his words, like the noise of a multitude of people, and the roaring of the sea. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision of the heavenly being. For men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great panic overwhelmed them so that they ran away and they hid themselves. You guys remember me teaching this a couple of weeks ago. I told you about an event where I went into Zion's Hope and I came out of the tabernacle after they did a tabernacle service. And I said to somebody, man, their special effects were amazing. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, that massive angel that was behind the, the uh, priest. And they went, we don't know what you're talking about. Well, I saw it, but they didn't. And sometimes you will see something that I don't see. Ben sees things all the time that I don't see. Sometimes we see the same things, though, don't we? Occasionally we get to see the same thing. That's when we really know we saw it for sure. Okay, so nobody saw it but him and they all fleed. So I was left alone and I saw the great vision yet no strength was left in me for my normal appearance turned to a deathly pale and I grew weak and I grew faint with fright. He's really scared. Then I heard the sound of his words. And when I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face towards the ground. Do you remember who else did that? Abraham did that. Abraham fell into a deep sleep when Yahweh walked through the pieces when he had made covenant with him for the land. When they cut the, Abraham cut the pieces in half and then Yahweh walked through those pieces and Abraham fell into a deep sleep. Well, Daniel does the same thing. He gets in the presence of this incredible angelic being and he just falls into a deep sleep. Then behold, a hand touched me and it set me up unsteadily on my hands, my knees. So he can't stand up yet. He's on his hands and knees. And so he said to me, oh, Daniel, you mighty, you highly regarded and greatly beloved man. How would you like God to say that about you? Yeah. Understand the words that I am about to say to you. So listen, understand, stand upright for I have now been sent to you and while he was saying these words to me I stood up trembling stand upright is the same thing the angel said to John in the book of revelations 
more than once. Verse 12. And then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand this and humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. Words are weapons. Words move mountains. Words kill and words make alive. Words, prayer, and repentance brings angels onto the scene. Your words, the angel came because of Daniel's words. How important are your words? Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in the opposition of me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chiefs of the celestial princes, he came to help me, for I had been left there with the king of Persia. So he's fighting principalities, trying to get this word to Daniel. Now, I have come. This is why he came. He came to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is in regard to the days yet to come. Angels come in response to your words, to your warfare, and to tell you what is about to come, even if it's a long way off. Angels bring understanding. I need understanding. Do you? Angels are working, and they're present if you see them or not. They are there to assist us in this walk. We're facing troublesome times. So don't forget the weapons in your arsenal to fight with. Ask for angelic assistance as you face these coming days. You're gonna need it. I feel like I'm walking between raindrops of judgment sometimes and that I keep dodging the drops as the father leads me. He has to tell us where to step where there's not landmines. Soon it will pour, and our only hope is that we are in the Father and he is in us. He is our protection, and he will send the angels in response to your words. In the Amplified in James 5, 16, it says, therefore confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt and the persistent prayer of a righteous man or a believer can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Your words, your prayer, your warfare can have tremendous power. In James 5, 16, it says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. For those of us that are looking for healing, it's about confessing our sins. It's about getting us right. It's about getting our heart right. And then the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. So when we are praying for other people, I think one of the first things we need to do is ask God to show us where we may have sin, where we may need confession, where we can get our heart clean before we start praying for other people to be healed, then we need to pray for our sins to be forgiven. What are we walking in that we have not confessed? And how fervent are we willing to spend? How much time are we willing to spend? How persistent are we willing to be in our prayer life? Talking to me as much as anybody else. I'm a, I'm a scholar. I, I'm in the word all the time. And we pray on a regular basis and we talk to the Lord all day long. But I, you know, I used to pray fervently hours, hours a day. And maybe those are seasons. Maybe God brings us through seasons where we pray more than we study and then we study more than we pray. But regardless, if you want angelic assistance in your warfare, they will come when they hear you pray. They're going to be sent. 
if you see them or not, they will be sent. And they are part of your armor, as much as the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod, the, the armor, the, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. They're all part of your warfare, of your, of your arsenal. And I believe that I've seen some things in the arsenal of God in his warfare room that are much more frightening than what the devil even has to offer. If Satan can come up with terrifying things, don't you think that God's a whole lot better at doing that? Yeah. <laughs> he, he can frighten Satan. So Father, we praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this book of Daniel and all that it shows us about warfare and about prayer and about being persistent and about the angels showing up. Father, we just ask you to have your way in our life. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, of our transgressions, of our attitudes, of our self-love instead of loving others more than ourselves. Father, teach us to love other people, to pray for other people, to lift them up, to encourage them, Father, and to bless Yahweh because you are the one true God and you're coming. And we thank you, Father, according to Revelations 22, 7, you are going to split that eastern sky and you are coming for your saints. And Father, we look up because our redemption draws nigh. We give you praise and we give you thanksgiving. Father, go with these people as they leave this place. Father, keep them safe. Keep their steps each step every single day. Help them to think about where they're going. Get their minds right so their bodies will follow and help them to ponder each step that they take every single day, each relationship that they have, everything that they buy, everything that they say, that they sell, that they would have their, the purpose of their life wound up and tied up in who you are and in your kingdom, because we're going to spend eternity with you. You are the lover of our soul, and you gave your life. Yeshua, you gave your life. You spilled your blood, and you did it for us because of your great love for us. You look beyond the cross, and you saw us you saw us. We thank you for loving us, for, for upholding us, and that we are Segula, Segula, precious in your hand. And we bless your holy name in the name of Yeshua. Amen. If you like this teaching, please give us a thumbs up, ring the bell so you can get notified when we have another teaching. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. And God bless you. And have a wonderful super week. And press in and learn to do your warfare. And ask the Lord to send you all the help that you need in Yeshua's name. Amen.